video function off and then we won't be able to see you. And with that, I would like to welcome Jeremy, a pioneer of online talks for Pioneer or Guinea Pig for Gerlach Museum. I'm sure we're all looking forward to it. Yeah, if you want to just take a seat okay. and say a quick hello. <clears throat> okay, here we go. So we're just going to move into a function where we um, share our screen, hopefully. So it'll look a little bit odd for a second or two, and then we'll hopefully navigate our way to Jeremy's first slide. Now, can some people stick their thumbs up if they can see that first slide? Hurrah! There's there we go then. People. Yeah, that's fine. Sure, you want I'll see if I can minimize that for you, Jeremy. Two seconds. There you go. Okay. Okay, right. Well, we're off. Okay. Can we can you all hear me? Yes. <laughs> we'll soon see. You can't answer, so yes. Right. This talk I hope will be about 30 minutes. We'll see how it goes. And it's a brief introduction to the subject of a book I've just written called Escaping Isolation. And it's nothing to do with the pandemic, you'll be glad to hear. The title is a complete coincidence. The subject is the isolation of the Gerloch area in the past and how it gradually became known to and reached by the outside world. Our area was isolated in several ways. It was a long distance from the main centers of population and few people bothered to visit it. In 1700, it might take you four days to travel here from Inverness and 10 days from Edinburgh. It was cut off by mountains and moorland and difficult to reach across rough, roadless ground. Little information about it leaked out into the world beyond. Going back to the very beginning, 20,000 years ago in the last ice age, it might have looked like this. It took a long time for the ice to melt and plants and animals to arrive. And then the first people began to trickle in. They all came by sea. The first comers may have sailed up the coast and landed here at Red Point, where they lived in caves and made stone tools. Over the next 5,000 years or more, People kept arriving, still by sea, and bringing with them new ideas and new technologies, ending with the MacLeods, a clan of Viking descent. The population was still, probably still small. Is that all right? Yeah. The first such, excuse me, sorry, I've skipped something. Yeah. That's right. Right. Sorry, technical hitch there. The first to open the door from the east and come overland to our area were the Mackenzies, based in Kintail and in Easter Ross. The first Mackenzie laird of Gerloch, Hector Roy, came from Bran, near Contin, in the east. And a number of Mackenzies must have travelled from Contin along Strathconnan and Strathbran and down this glen, Glen Doherty, to Kinloch U, a difficult walk over rough, overgrown ground. Once they reached Kinloch U, Loch Marie was the one weakness in the mountain barrier. Travellers could row or sail along the loch to reach Pulieu or Gerloch, but it took a brave and enterprising visitor to reach the west coast. The first such non-Mackenzie visitor whose name we know was Timothy Pont, who was touring Scotland from 1580 and mapping the land. This is his sketch map of the area north of Loch Marie with outlines of some of the hills, a few of them sideways. For, this, for its time, this was an extraordinary achievement, even if Anchelloc is in the wrong place. Meanwhile, sorry, he, he tried to map the Loch Marie Islands 
Imagine doing that to yourself without a helicopter. We don't know how he did it. Using Pont's heroic work, his notes and sketches and finished maps, in 1654, a Dutch cartographer, the famous Jan Blau, produced his maps of Scotland as part of his world atlas. This is a sketch of his map of our area. The only change I've made is to give their modern names to the places which Pont had shown. On earlier maps, the area was mostly a blank, but this map is very different. Westeros becomes real. Although it still has few visitors, you will notice that there are no roads. Much later in 1820, another traveler, John McCulloch said, said this, Loch Marie lies so completely out of the road and so far beyond the courage of ordinary travelers that except by pennant, I believe it has never been visited. That was a gross exaggeration, but it was significant. The area was still isolated even then. There was one major exception. Loch Marie was certainly visited between 1610 and 1630. The senior branch of the Mackenzies, known as the Kintail Mackenzies, bought Lewis in 1610. And part of the payment to one of its owners, Sir George Hay, was a remarkable agreement that on their land on the north side of Loch Marie, he could set up ironworks using their oak trees to make charcoal and local bog iron. So Loch Marie became an industrial centre with three smelters and English workers using local and then imported iron ore to make cannons and the like, which were then exported from Poulieu. This picture shows the remains of the first blast furnace in Scotland beside the River Yew. But it was only a short-lived exposure to the world by sea. What we need is roads and bridges over the rivers. Meanwhile, one effect of all this was a longer lasting sea connection. Poulieu became the port for travel to Lewis with a regular packet or ferry. And incidentally, Colin Mackenzie, Lord of Kintail, was made the Earl of Seaforth by King James VI for his support and his work in Lewis. A traveller called John Knox, not the John Knox, of course, in 1786 wrote of his crossing from Lewis. He said, a packet goes from Stornoway to Poulieu every fortnight, and when Seaforth is at Stornoway, once every week. I embraced this opportunity to return to the continent. The vessel was small and in a very improper state for going to sea, and ought to have been broken up long since. She is employed at certain seasons for transporting cattle. He tells how they were becalmed in the minch and carried by the tide. Then a storm blew up and they had to flee into Loch Gerloch and try to find shelter behind Longer Island overnight. They managed to reach Poulieu the next day, surprised that the ship had not sunk. Knox was heading for Torridon. He walked up the River Yew and hired a boat with rowers to take him along Loch Marie, about 12 miles, then walked to Kinloch Yew, where he stayed in a primitive inn. Even then, Kinloch Yew was an important meeting point. Next day, he set out on horseback for Torridon, first fording two rivers. At that time, there were no built roads, but merely paths trodden by feet and hooves. The track, said Knox, was composed mostly of swamps and gullies, for which our horses did not appear well adapted. We struggled through an uninhabited morass without the appearance of a path. He commented that in the highlands, in the highlands it is hardly agreed on by travellers which is the line of road, everyone making one for himself. Even sheep follow better routes, following levels better and selecting better gradients. But 20 years earlier, there had in fact been one attempt to build a road all the way from Contin to Poulieu. 
This was a military road, like the roads General Wade had built to the south, such as this one over the Corrie Yarrick Pass. In charge was Wade's successor, Major William Caulfield. There was some hope that a road like this could do away with the isolation of the West, and that Poulieu, with both the Stornoway Ferry and the road, would become an important town. But Caulfield died after four years of work in 1767, and the road was abandoned on the orders of the British Treasury to save money. Traces of its line can be seen today, but it was far from finished and never good enough to ride or drive along. This is a rather bumpy part of the route between Slatterdale and the Tolly Pass. In 1799, Lady Seaforth set out in her carriage to drive from Contin to Poulieu along Caulfield's Road. By the time she had reached Achenault, after only 15 miles, her carriage was a wreck, a write-off. But at that time, there was one regular roadless journey made between Gerloch and the East. The Gerloch Mackenzie Lairds bought an estate at Conan in Easter Ross, which came to be used as their winter residence with Conan House built in 1758. This picture includes later extensions. The annual three-day trek each way was a festive occasion involving a lot of crofters and horses to carry the family and their possessions. A track was built from Flowerdale House to Slatterdale on Loch Marie, and the inn was built at Kinloch U. Along Loch Marie, the family and their possessions went by boat, while the horses were led along the military road. Then the baggage was put on sledges and pulled by the horses. There were no wheeled vehicles. If the west coast was to become open to the world, accessible, less remote and known about, a proper road for wheeled access was desperately needed. And in 1803 it looked as if it might be built. That was then this man, the remarkable Thomas Telford, came on the scene, a Scottish civil engineer. On his advice, the British Parliament set up two commissions under his control to help the Highlands. One commission would see to the building of the Caledonian Canal, seen here at Fort Augustus. The other would build roads and bridges at last. It would work for 20 years, paying half the cost of the new roads, while the landowners paid the other half. Telford himself would oversee the surveying, the putting out to tender, and the building of the roads and bridges. He earned the nickname, the Colossus of Roads. This system worked well in Sutherland, where the road building transformed the county. One Sutherlander wrote, a more striking example of what roads can achieve, and achieve too in an extremely poor country, has rarely been seen. Such a quick exhibition of what natural wealth lay latent in such a country is unexampled. The system also worked well in Inverness Shire, where everyone in the county paid a tax to help cover their half of the cost of the roads. But in the county of Ross, it all went horribly wrong. The East refused to be taxed to subsidize the West. Many landowners were reluctant and their tenants were too poor to contribute. The cost of building roads in difficult country was higher than expected. Good surveyors and contractors were hard to find. And so it took 10 years for the first and only parliamentary road, as they called them, to be built here, from Contin to Achnachine and on to Loch Carron. This is the Telford Bridge at Achnachine. Soon, a stagecoach was running from Inverness to Skye, but Gerloch was still cut off. Next should be the road from Achnachine to Loch Marie down Glen Doherty. 
The route was surveyed in 1811, and the cost was estimated at £4,000. That's about £400,000 today. Half of this sum was raised locally, and tenders were invited to build the road. Three contractors made offers, but each was for about £7,000. Perhaps they were really saying, no thank you, let someone else build it. The project was shelved. It would take another 23 years for the road to be built, not by Telford's Roads Commission, but by a small local committee. In June 1807, this local roads committee sat for the first time, the trustees of the 6th district. Its chairman was usually the Laird of Gerloch, and it had a permanent secretary, and various local landowners attended. It met for 55 years. We don't know how it related to Telford's commission or why it was set up, probably by act of parliament, because this county was an especially difficult one. Gerloch Museum has the minute books. The trustees started confidently by producing a list of roads to be built, the four shown on this map. One of them has never been built, and their list did not include the Achnachine Road, as Telford would see to that, or so they hoped. Road building started in a very small way, yard by yard at 10 pence a yard. But raising money proved to be almost impossible, due, as the minutes say, to the extreme poverty of the lower classes and the fallacious promises of the wealthier classes. It would take too long to follow the epic journey of the trustees as they struggled over the next half century to get anything done. But they did eventually achieve several important roads, a better road from Gerloch to Slatterdale, the Gerloch to Poulieu Road in 1831, as seen here, the Achnachine to Lochmarie Road in 1834, and Kinlochew to Torridon, but that was paid for by the Torridon landowner. Here it can be seen dwarfed by the mountains. An almost chance in 1837 of building the big one, the Loch Marie Road, with government help, was scuppered when the surveyor estimated a cost of £4,000, double the available funds. That was along the south side of Loch Marie. A road along the north side would have cost even more, £5,300. The road sank without trace for another 10 years, partly because a distraction turned up, Poulieu Bridge. The River U had always been a formidable barrier, dividing Poulieu in two and cutting off the Alt Bay area, and often uncrossable. The bridge was completed in 1843. This picture shows the original bridge, which has now been replaced. And by the way, the big Grignard River would not be bridged until the early 1900s. Progress was very slowly being made, but the saga of the missing Loch Marie Road continued. The Gerloch area was still isolated. The trustees had tried loans, government grants, attempts to get cash from Easter Ross, appeals to parliament, threats of going to court, but nothing seemed to work until in 1846, the great potato famine came to their rescue. The Highlands were badly hit by the potato blight. It brought the north of Scotland to the attention of the south, and they responded generously, setting up this pithily named committee. The Relief Board, to give it its shorter name, administered the destitution fund, which was used to feed the hungry, or better, as they soon realised, to pay them for useful work, such as road building. This is Lady Mary Mackenzie and her son Osgood, the founder of Inverview Garden. 
She helped to persuade the board to spend its money on the Loch Marie Road. And so, one day in May 1848, Osgood Mackenzie, then only six years old, dug the first turf, surrounded by a cheering crowd of workers and locals, and the road was underway. And after the 41 years of delay, it took less than two years to build. Osgood later recalled, how well do I remember the first wheeled vehicle, a carrier's cart that ever came to Gerlach and the excitement it caused. A carrier's cart, today the equivalent might be Tesco delivery vans. The trustees continued to meet for another 13 years. There were minor side roads to be built and the arrival of wheels revealed shortcomings in earlier roads and they often had to be realigned. For example, the old Kerrysdale Road was moved to Kerry Glen. Here you can just see it up above the once famous Kerry Falls, now dry thanks to a hydroelectric scheme. Today, as you may know, this road is liable to subsidence and is still single track. It needs to be moved for the third time. And in the 20th century, the arrival of motor vehicles would mean more realignment and widening, so that here above Poulieu, for example, we have three roads. One is for foot and hoof, two for horse-drawn vehicles, and three for cars. Gerloch might be, no longer be inaccessible, but it was still remote. Reaching it meant a long, uncomfortable carriage drive on gravel surfaced roads and slow with a maximum speed of 15 miles an hour. And Poulieu had lost its status as the port for the Outer Isles because the Seaforths sold Lewis in 1844. Something more was needed to ease the journey and to make the area more attractive to outsiders. So what was that something? It was a steam in two forms, trains from the east and ships from the west. First, the trains. The Inverness to Kyle line was opened in 1870. An innkeeper working in Achnasheen commented on the workers who built it. They are working quite close to us here and they are all sometimes very troublesome when they get drunk and especially on paydays. I never saw men fighting till I saw the navvies. But I think the house will pay much better this season. They use such quantities of whiskey and meat. Soon after the line opened, the railway company built the Achnasheen Hotel, which burnt down in 1994. The hotel proprietor provided a small fleet of wheeled vehicles for people to drive themselves to Gerloch and also operated a mail bus daily, except Sundays, with space for passengers, something we miss today. Twenty years later, several landowners, including Sir Kenneth Mackenzie of Gerloch, proposed a railway line from Achnasheen to Alt Bay to be built by the Great North of Scotland Railway Company for £200,000. It was one of four suggested lines to the west coast, to Alt Bay, Alapool, Loch Inver, and Loch Laxford. None of them was built. But a strong case was made for the Alt Bay one. This is one of the original plans showing the end of the line at Loch U. Alt Bay would make an excellent port for ships to the Outer Isles and for transporting fish to the south. And Loch U is an ideal sheltered harbour, as would be proved in the Second World War. A pier 165 metres long would be built. Another part of the plan. The line here skirts the Loch Marie Hotel. Arguments against it include the havoc it would create in the crofts which it crossed in Alt Bay and Poulieu, the damage to the wilder areas, the spoiling of views along Loch Marie, 
the absence of the biggest population centre, Gerloch, would you have voted for it? It might not have been as easy to build as they thought. To get round Tolly Rock, two tunnels would be needed, shown here, through very hard Louisian gneiss. There was also the descent of Glen Doherty, and the shore of Loch Eu is very steep, but it might have been the most scenic railway in Scotland. The ferry port had now been lost by both Poulieu and Alt Bay, and today it is Ullapool. As one result of the opening of the Achnachine Railway was that Gaelic Estate became tourist aware, and they immediately built two hotels, the Loch Marie Hotel, which was designed for fishermen, and Gaelic Hotel for the general public. Within 10 years, the estate sold them both to an entrepreneur who would be better able to develop them, James Hornsby, the manager of the Loch Marie Hotel. They were both so popular that he enlarged them. He gave Gellock Hotel a new south wing, as you can see in this advertisement. And a smaller north wing was added later the hotel was very popular with a wonderful range of facilities and attracted the outside world to Gerloch in a big way, as it is doing again now. It was no coincidence that Hornsby bought Gerloch Hotel in 1881 and enlarged it. That year saw the launching of a steamship which would call in weekly at Gerloch with passengers and goods for the next 50 years, the SS Claymore which was operated by David McBrain on the Glasgow Stornoway route. And it may have doubled the number of visitors. Before McBrain's, from 1842, a series of steamships had made occasional visits to Gerloch, but the earliest known shipping company here was run from about 1830 by the McIntyre family who lived on Longer Island. Their ship was the topmast schooner Black Diamond, which traded along the coast and went as far as Liverpool. It may have looked something like this. There was another important schooner, a steamer rather, in the area from 1883. James Hornsby had the idea of bringing a miniature steamship to Loch Marie as a tourist attraction. This is the museum's model of her the SS Mabel. She was built in Glasgow and steamed up to Loch Marie, to Loch U, sorry. The biggest problem was then getting her overland to Loch Marie. She sank into the road and was stuck there for three weeks, and they had to make a diversion to let the mail coach pass. She then spent the winter in a bog at Croft, with, it is said, her first skipper, another McIntyre, sleeping on board. But once she was on the loch, she was a great success with regular sailings for passengers and sightseers and stops at Tolly, at the Loch Marie Hotel, and at the head of the loch. This is the pier at Tolly Bay. Transport could be had from there to Gerloch Hotel. After 28 years of operation, she was beached and sadly left to rust away. Would it be good to have a new Mabel on the loch today? But how did Hornsby get his idea for a steamer on Loch Marie? It is just possible that it was suggested to him by his most famous guest at the Loch Marie Hotel, who had cruised in the Rob Roy on Loch Catrin. She was, of course, Queen Victoria, and she stayed there in 1877 for a week, taking over the whole hotel and her approval did a lot to encourage visitors to come to the Gerloch area. The Royal Train took her from Deeside to Achnachine and a fleet of carriages to the hotel. Here she took short walks, painted, wrote, boated to the islands and went on local road trips, just like any tourist. She made this painting from a hotel window. To her, everything was beautiful, grand and romantic. She visited Torridon, changing horses at Kinlochu, 
and admired, as she said, the grand, wild, savage-looking, but most beautiful and picturesque glen of Torridon, with the dark mural precipices of that most extraordinary mountain, Ben Liugach. She was driven to Gerloch and to Shieldegg Lodge. This was to her a small cottage on the sea with a pretty garden. Her standards were rather different from ours. She appreciated the peace and quiet of Westeros and afterwards wrote that she had enjoyed this beautiful spot and glorious scenery very much. The little house, that's the hotel, was cosy and very quiet and there were no constant interruptions as at home. When the Queen visited Shieldegg Lodge, it was let to two wealthy Englishmen for the deer stalking and fishing. Most of the big houses in the area were let like this and many of them were built for just this purpose. 38,000 acres of Gerlach estate were turned into a deer forest. At last, the estates had a major source of income, useful for building hotels, for example. Inviting rich outsiders to kill your deer was very profitable. So, in many ways, Gerlach was ready for the 20th century. There was one vital improvement needed, still, and that was the mapping of the area. The Ordnance Survey was set up around 1800, but it took a long time to triangulate and survey the whole of Britain, and the maps of this area didn't appear until the 1880s, but they were revolutionary. This is part of the first one-inch map. One thing which the survey achieved was to fix the names. Here are three which kept changing, but are now fixed by being on the map. Today, the hills are one of the big attractions of the area, and we have many of the finest in the country. Once they were ugly, frightening places of no value to be avoided. But that changed, and Queen Victoria helped the process of turning the hills into beautiful, romantic and grand features. Today, many people come here for the great outdoors to view and enjoy the unique scenery and the nature of our district, its wildness and its variety. They also come to see Benet National Nature Reserve, the award-winning Gerlock Museum, Inverview Garden, and many other attractions. The, the A832 road, of course, has been doubled, straightened, and resurfaced. And that, by the way, is another epic story taking 70 years. Now that personal transport by car has replaced public transport by train or ship, many more people can visit. I won't mention the North Coast 500, which brings its own benefits and problems. The Gerlock area no longer seems remote and it is easy to access and it is well known. We have well and truly escaped from isolation. Or have we? The Guardian, reporting on the museum's recent award, said that Gerlock is strikingly isolated. The nearest town in Venice is about 75 miles away. Oh well, this is the book I mentioned at the start, which says a lot more about these and many other themes. It's for sale in Gerlock Museum. Thank you, Jeremy. Well done. I'll stop the screen sharing. Hopefully we'll see everybody coming back in. Karen, can I hand back over to you? Uh, sure. Yeah, I am sure that there might be one or two questions. Um, just question etiquette. If you do have a question, can you use the Zoom function that allows you to raise your hand? So that we know you have a question and then I will ask you for your question and then we won't have everyone talking over each other. Jeremy, in, in answer to your the question that you posed, um, 
Yes, we should have another Mabel. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yes. Um, I, I have still not managed to get to Isle Marie, mainly because it's, it's just not easy to get there. And I think it would be fabulous if we had a boat on Loch Marie that, that perhaps called at the islands as well. Absolutely. So I'm just keeping an eye on chat here. Um, Bella is asking whether you would consider making an audio book, Jeremy. A new career for you. What's an audio book? Do you mean reading out the whole book? I believe Sam Hewen's doing those these days. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that would work with this book. Uh, read it yourself and then see what you think. Um, yes. Uh, no is the answer, the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> at the moment. Alex Gray is asking whether the Vikings also visited Loch Marie. Yes, certainly. There's a story of the, the Viking and his wife at, on Loch Marie Island, isn't there? He kept a, a smaller boat on Loch Marie and kept his main longship on Loch U and went off raiding from based on Loch Marie. Yes, they were there, certainly. Whether they brought the longship, managed to get a longship up to Loch Marie is another question. Unlikely, I think. So, um, Rob Bruce is asking whether boat ownership in Scotland might have been reduced by the roads, because apparently Scotland has got very low boat ownership. What sort, what sort of boats? Personal boat ownership? I, I assume so. Yes, that's an interesting yes. question. I really have no idea at all. <laughs> that, that would be a good research project, wouldn't it, for yeah. someone? I would imagine yeah. boat ownership would have been involved with fishing on the sea locks. They must be people, fishing boats, yes. People maybe yes. wouldn't have seen an advantage to having them on the mm. fresh water. There were a number of yachts. I mean, Pennant, for example, came up here by yacht from Glasgow. No, from Ayr, I think. They rented a yacht, with a very large yacht, with some friends and sailed up as far as... Little lock broom. Okay. Uh, we've got another question here from Neil. It's asking, did the material for the RN, what's the RN, come by road or by sea? For the Royal Navy? Did the Royal Navy bring their materials in by road or sea? during World War II? Well, a lot of stuff was suddenly brought in by road because they did widen the road in a few, some places and they started tarring it, the single track road, and they had to rebuild Pooliu Bridge to make it wider to take military vehicles. Um, so the answer is probably both. Um, it'd be safer by road, I suppose. I see Jackie is... Um is disagreeing with me about the Mabel. She thinks that motorised boats on, on Loch Marie would not be a good idea because it's much nicer to kayak there. I visit the islands that way. If you have a kayak, yes. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that. Are there any other questions? I would like to... Um, let people know if you don't already that we, Jeremy was talking about um, Queen Victoria and uh, this, well, the r romantic period where um, the Highlands were um, suddenly viewed as, as a place of beauty rather than uh, inaccessible and dangerous. And we do have a, an exhibition on at the minute in the museum downstairs. You don't even have to pay to get in and see it. It's a free exhibition. It's on loan to us from Historic Environment Scotland and it's called Romantic Scotland. And it's actually using photographs of the earliest Scottish photographers who came to the Highlands to contrast with the artworks that were being um, painted by the, uh, by the artists in the Romantic period. It's a really lovely exhibition. So if you're in the area, you can call in and see that. 
I see there's a question here to Karen from Bella asking what prompted Jeremy's interest in researching roads and transport. Question to Karen. No, <laughs> question to you. Oh, right. <laughs> um, I think what prompted the, in this particular topic was discovering about the minutes of the Roads Committee, uh, which Roy McIntyre, the chairman of the museum, has very kindly transcribed, typed, out, typed them all out, and there's an awful lot of them. Uh, and that was fascinating. But apart from that, I mean, the area has such a, such a wide history, so, so many topics of interest in it from prehistoric times onwards. You can't help but be interested, especially if you're retired here, as I am. And another um, couple of thoughts here. Uh, Alex Bray mm. pointing out that he proposed the idea of an electric boat on Loch Marie, but yes. uh, apparently that, that didn't get anywhere. And Magella is asking, so she's thinking about the the railway projects that never happened that you mentioned during your talk and how HS2 has been progress and uh, whether in light of this we we might see see that revisited. Did I say something? Hamish McLennan is my name. Hello Hamish. Yeah um, I live near Bewley. Um, as a child it would be in the middle 50s my father was building the first restaurant at the uh, Enview Gardens down beside the shore. And my father said, he'd like a day off school. Oh, yes. So we, I went up with a load of timber along the, what I call the old Lochbury Road. And we got the Gearloch. How were we going to get up this bray? I mean, the, the roads were... I can't remember how we had loaded it or not, but even in the 50s, it was, it, it was an adventure. And when the men were working there, the union rules for the joiners would only be allowed home once in six weeks. It's just it, it, because it took so long to, to get across country. And then I knew boys that played at a dance band and they played up in Alt Bay, which I believe was famous for dancers in its day. And they can remember whatever time they left Alt Bay and there was along the old road of Loch Bidi along by the, the coast of uh, the, the shore of the, the loch. About half past four in the morning, they stopped, stripped the weights and had a wash to wake themselves up so they could get back to the, uh, the east coast. But I mean, that's even in the 50s. It just shows how things have changed. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite, quite. Again, what, uh, my ancestors came up from Edinburgh, Ingalls, to uh, uh, Strath Rosedale and all this in 1828 and then in 1840 they were in Achnashelach. How did they get from all this across land to, um, to Achnashelach? Obviously there was paths and that. It was, mm -hmm. it was yeah. quite just, but people, well, they did get around. Thank you for that, Hamish. Good day, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Tell me, Pam is asking how long your research took you? Well, that's a difficult question. Um, it was a re result of the lockdown and the pandemic, I think, mostly. So it was a, probably a couple of months at that time when there was nothing else to do. Because uh, I thought of the title early at the beginning of the year, and then the, the pandemic came along afterwards, and the title seemed rather appropriate. Um, but probably February, March, April, how about that? part-time. <laughs> that sounds like good going. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I would like to say a big thanks to Jeremy. I'm sure from all of us, I'm, I have no idea how you do a round of applause on Zoom, I'm afraid, but I'll, I'll do a little one. Thank you very much. Um, no, normally, at this point in the proceedings, I, I would invite everyone to tea and cake as well, but, but um, I'm afraid you're going to have to make your own this evening. But I, I, we would like to hear how you find our first online talk, so please do um, drop us an email and let us know. It, I'm sure many of you might like to um, make a donation um, in appreciation of Jeremy's talk. 
and you'll find a link at the bottom of the email that I sent you if, if you do want to do that. Please look out for uh, more online talks coming up through our newsletter, website, uh, on Facebook, etc. And uh, remember that the museum is open still at the moment, at least until the end of October, we'll be open uh, from Tuesday through to Saturdays. And just one final thing to mention, uh, my final media appearance, hopefully this week will be tomorrow night when I will be talking on BBC Four on Front Row, and, and I, that starts at seven o'clock tomorrow night, um, about why uh, Gerloch Museum has been awarded the Art Fund Prize and um, just a bit about the museum and our collection. Yes, Rob, Radio 4, tomorrow night, Radio 4, seven o'clock. Thank you all uh, very much for joining us and uh, see you next time. Oh, and thanks to Ailey for doing all the technical stuff. Yay! I yes, was never well here. I was never here. <laughs> <laughs>